Thank you, Nikki, for possibly the best introduction I've had today. I am going to talk a bit about HIPS. Um, obviously, uh, I've got to thank all the organizing committees for setting us up, this up, and for Julie and Mario for keeping, uh, keeping communicated with us. Uh, not least, try and stick on time and also be friendly, and all this football stuff is very unfriendly. I, uh, there's Phil Glasgow's Northern Ireland, a few places above the mighty Cape Verde. If we drop all the way down to 44, we'll see Scotland. We didn't qualify, but thankfully, we're just nudging ahead of the Scandinavian neighbours. So it's not all bad. Don't tell me to calm down. I've got three minutes left. I don't do calm. Actually, I do calm, okay. Return to play. We're going to look... Um, a number of things with this. Don't worry too much about slides. Apparently, you're going to get, uh, get the slides with uh, all the relevant information. Um, and I'm, I've chosen these words quite carefully. I've changed a few things. Um, Evidence-informed decision-making is really what I'm all about. I'm interested in and applying the sciences to uh, context-specific, not sports-specific. I'm looking at context-specific situations. As Nikki says, I'm involved in rugby. I'm a sports physiotherapist. I've been involved in rugby just after, since, just after it went professional in the 90s. And I've been with the international team now for uh, 10 years. I've just completed my third World Cup, which is one of the reasons I think I got the, the invite. Um, I've got a declaration, I am addicted to sport, I'm addicted to music, and I have a declaration of interest in the internet, not the stuff about cats playing pianos and falling off tables. I'm interested in things like the education value and funny signs. So as Nikki didn't do any housekeeping, please, in case of fire, do exit the building before tweeting. <laughs> uh, I'm from Edinburgh, beautiful place. Please come and visit and make sure you get in touch with me. Uh, I'll show you some stuff. This is from the third World Cup that I attended, and uh, the global exposure in, in rugby now is enormous, um, not least featuring in, in websites, featuring on pages, um, decisions seeming to be uh, absolutely critical within hours, and also, will the coach know what's going on? He obviously quotes straight after games. Um, and, and so we're going to use some of those experiences to how I look around uh, return, return to play. And what are the aims really here? Well, I'm looking to challenge a bit. Um, we've, we've already gone through challenging the clinical bias. I'm going to go a bit more through that. Looking at enhancing the awareness of return to plays and uh, what happens around the hip. Offer ways that you might consider your own pathways, uh, building on what other people have done. And I'm, I'm jumping on a lot of people. If you see your own work there, please feel free to stand up or something, because there'll be a lot of you, a lot of you in the front row, who will know exactly what I'm talking about, uh, because you've already talked about it. This is a good place to start. Journal of Sports Science, uh, an editorial by Barry Drust, misspell. Um, and you can almost feel the seething frustration here at the situations our athletes get into and return to play situations. And also, what on earth are we doing about it? Too few, too few, too few. Um, Ian's, Ian's work's been really interesting to me. Um, it was great to meet him last night, finally. Um, not least looking about things like dispute resolution can be complicated, it certainly can. And uh, there's a high potential for conflict. This external information coming in from family, perhaps, uh, teammates, not least people who've had the same injury in the past, as if all injuries are the same. Uh, men's health, very helpful, um, giving us information, the internet, uh, and the coach. And the coach has got valid and good, solid reasons for being involved. And Leslie Podlog has some excellent work in terms of coach perceptions and what they might give. But sometimes the communication process is tricky, um, not least with their players. So if this is their, the last message they gave before the team goes out, you probably weren't expecting that to happen. Um, and Dr. Boris, uh, riding the pachyderm, I, I found a, a really interesting piece talking about how difficult it is for the small part of the rational side having to sometimes deal with the enormous elephant that, that can take over, particularly pitch side, and I think a, a great reason why things like the head injury assessment for concussion in rugby allows the, uh, the opportunity for us to just go a step away from the critical feature of the game and actually go into a quiet space. Um, I tweeted about this bef yesterday before he did his bit today because it, I think it really is interesting and important. It may not be clear to anyone involved in the process as to who's making the decisions, um, who's responsible. And uh, we looked a little bit at that. Again, Ian talks about risk, pain, injury, paradox. So facts, this gets really big at times, uh, fact, facts surrounding the decision. I, I, I think uh, it's absolutely key from what we've heard that the assessment of all benefits and possible harms become important uh, for everyone concerned. And uh, 
this is where a formal structure is useful. We do a lot, a lot of writing down of, of goals and goal setting. Smart goals are a really key part of return to play. Um, they don't have to be timelines. They can be other areas and th there's been a bit of discussion around that and I think the next few years we'll see us moving into that. But I would recommend that, that kind of goal settings written down. Um, there's been some great stuff in emotional framework. We're going to hit on that a bit strongly as well. Look at this. Context is key, and it really is. We'll see some great slides there. Uh, you can stand up if you see your name. And uh, this athlete's psychological readiness to, to perform, but also having the confidence is really key. Uh, this is interesting. Messages can get mixed up. This is a young girl who had to draw what she wanted to be when she grew up. She wanted to be her mum. Her mum's written a le uh, the letter into the school the next day. Dear Mrs. Jones, I wish to clarify, I am not now, nor have I ever been an exotic dancer. <laughs> She's pointing out this is not a pole. She, in fact, sells shovels at her local DIY shop. <laughs> Messages have to be clear. When it comes to the hip, the, the hip suffers. It's, it's not as in-your-face contemporary as concussion research is just now, um, nor is it as sexy as the hamstring or certainly the ACL. Until now, when I looked for some anatomical uh, images of our rugby team, I, I, I did stumble across a, an old calendar shot. It's not my personal collection. It's a calendar shot of two of our, two of our players uh, demonstrating some um, muscles. Um, <laughs> Across here, we've, we've got uh, one, of, one of our current young players who's just signed a new deal in, in Glasgow, so it's great we can hold on to him up there. But he has an extraordinary amount of internal rotation at the hip, and this provides challenges within our environment, but probably provides him with a way that he can break the gain line and that he can do things other players just can't do, unless you're Welsh, apparently. Um, Looking, femoral acetabular impingement is obviously a buzz thing in, in the hip, and it's, it's something that actually is referred to in the literature quite a bit, often position specific with the goaltenders in, in ice hockey, uh, interesting ballerinas in terms of performance. And uh, Kevin Wilk did the piece yesterday on baseball pitchers talking extensively about the shoulder, but actually they cop it. The human's an, an opportunist adapter, and unfortunately they will cop it further down around the, the hip joint as well. But we see a vast variation from a one to 11 months of return to play after surgery from Mark Philippon's work. And also one of the key things here is surgeons actually are very different, so there's a huge variety. <laughs> I've got a lot to get through and I've got some pretty intense people. And, and this stuff we've covered. Wait till we get to the good stuff. Um, yeah, uh, Super Mario has done some FAI material as well. Um, the key thing here is rehab is not time-based, but it's very individual. It shows how ahead of the curve he is. What more could he do if he passed off some of that 11-plus stuff and moved more into this area? I'd be interested. Um, but we should look at return to performance as well as return to play. Mohadi uh, has produced a piece talking about return to performance being one of the more key elements. Is this really a return to performance where despite being pain-free, 85% strength, there is some muscle atrophy and they display an antalgic gait three months after they've returned to the ice? Is, is that a return to performance? Is that what we're gauging here? However, they played at nine months post-injury and two-year follow-up there was nothing abnormal detected in any of those areas. Um, with the chondral defects, if there's a microfracture required, what we should know is that there's an average of four seasons after the surgery. That's what they're going to get from that, that uh, surgery. That's their return to play. Fractures in the, uh, around the hip requiring nailing. Our oh, case series here demonstrated, again, about a nine, nine and a half month return to sport. And uh, various people in the audience uh, with this piece in BGSM, a level, of, uh, level four evidence, but came across 18 case series worthy of reporting on. And the areas there, again, would be 87%, 82% return to sport, and more likely if they're pro rather than recreational. Again, these figures drop one and a half and three years after. So return to sport can't be deemed a single outcome for evaluating success. Uh, there's going to be some elegant uh, muscle work discussed later on. I just touched here on using the Munich muscle injury classification, looking at two thirds being structural and one third functional. So if, there's micro, if there is muscle damage, there'll be quite a bit of a difference in terms of your return to sport. And maybe that's expected if there's been damage. And therefore, it could be prognostically useful. Uh, this guy's got a lot longer than 16 days. 
I've seen, seen this photograph for, for, for many years. I actually saw the video about a month ago. It's brutal. Although he does run after the referee straight afterwards. Uh, just a, a piece here on where we've been in terms of a lot of the material that are very clinical signs here that people look for, um, including a sideline hip abduction. And I'm not sure how relevant that's going to be for my players to return to the sport. Uh, maybe as relevant as whether you're able to squat the family pet. Um, and then we look at kickers within the sports, and, and we can see quite apart from the fact that 89 to 93% appear right-footed, and the majority of musculoskeletal injuries are in that right leg, they're actually low risk. It's a 20-year study in NFL of kickers and under 500 injuries. If you're over 30, you'll take about three weeks to two to return to sport after that, unless there's surge, in which case you're up to the hundreds. Uh, the other thing about the right-footed kicker is the guys I've selected are both lefties. But just watch the action and you're probably already picking up a lot of the clinical features for this athlete that might cause a problem. He's also quite interesting because he lived in Romania for his first 11 years of his life before getting a, a, a university deal up at uh, Michigan and then joining three NFL teams. Here's another kicker. He's now a place kicker, and he's also European. He comes from Poland. Makes you wonder if the Americans breed any kickers. And again, watch the function. Um, this is the amount of equipment we wear in American football versus the amount of equipment we wear in rugby. It's not to say we're not scientific. We've done 3D motion capture of our kickers, and we established some trends in the kickers, which has allowed us to use the American football kicking net and look at strategies that we can reduce those musculoskeletal injuries that our players also suffer from. We've looked already in terms of outcome measures. We know about what they lack. And it's maybe just that we need to re-recognize injury, a bit like pain, as a complex, multi-dimensional concept. Um, and subjective criteria could be important. This is far from the most elegant of studies, but it, it was a study in Brazil from Cume et al, where they used a six-point assessment scale to track the daily evolution of being an athletic patient. And what they found was the parameter most associated with the return to play was confidence. And the perception as to whether they were able to return as before was whether there was a challenge to their emotional security. And if you imagine what his hips have to do to put him in that position, it's uh, quite a serious amount of work to manage to put your most furthest extremity onto the floor. Uh, this is one of my favorite models. This is a Carl Newell model of constraints, which demonstrate just how interacted we are between perception, decision-making, and action. And the constraints model is very interactive. This is what I believe, essentially, we do as physios, and that leads to the mechanotransduction process. The physical side of things, the organismic constraints, are modifiable or non-modifiable, as we would know from prevention of injury data. But the environment is things like foot surface interaction, weather, equipment, opposition. And the task is what we will actually set our athletes. And it's the rules of that task that are the constraints, how much we want them to do, what we want them to do. Do we do it fatigued um, and, and challenge other areas? But what's the actual task concerned? So they all interact and effectively affect that action, decision-making, and perceptions. So we know that per perception really affects task goals and action possibilities. And that anxiety, unfortunately, is what what uh, affects the interaction between perception and decision-making. Um, so environmental task constraints shape our decision-making. That's well written about as well in terms of ecological di um, dynamics. But in rugby terms, in ball sport terms, they're sports about space. We're trying to manipulate space to either kick or pass a ball with our hands or legs or move the space ourselves. And, uh, and it's effectively opportunities or possibilities for action. And this perception action research, I think, is really interesting. Uh, it's about the planning, what happens in that split second subconsciously in planning that's key. And there's actually a really nice crossover of data with road traffic accident data, because what we do with the child is exactly what we do with our athletes when we're rehabbing them. We stop, we'll listen, we'll look and we'll think. And if we're trying to estimate speeds of cars, we're trying to estimate distances of cars, distances of the far pavement from our near pavement, try and 
estimate our average walking speed. And as we cross, we're still listening and looking to see if there are any environmental changes. What's the road surface like? Anyone who walked home last night would know they took a bit longer to get across roads. So this perception action is comparable in sports because it's that ability to perceive when the environmental opportunities exist and what the possibilities are for action. As we can see, it exists in these ball sports where they're, where they're trying to manipulate space, American football with the line defense here, and court sports. And we can set our tasks up to reflect some of these. This is a, this is a rugby task specific type drill, and this is where I'd work with the coaches to establish drills that play to what they need to do. And this will also give them that confidence. This will give them competency again. Uh, unfortunately, the gaps will open and close pretty quickly, and as we know in sports, things happen sometimes unexpectedly. <laughs> but things can happen unexpectedly in, in, uh, in road situations as well, and sometimes on the field as well as in, in uh, road situations that can be down to someone else's mistakes. Are you kidding me? Three minutes? Let's, let's skip the road traffic crash, it's brutal. Uh, so what do we need to do as physios? Let's change the pedagogy. Less verbal feedback, let's try and offer tasks, let's try and offer roles for people so they can become problem solvers. Build Kelvin Giles' suggestion, build on his physical literacy suggestion and expand the vocabulary of movement. This plays to Phil Glasgow and Sam Blanchard, I think, strongly. Move them in every plane, every direction. Give them amplitude and every speed that you can. Offer complexity to the tasks. Movement problems give self-organization, and that, that is what allows those three areas of self-determination theory to have strong intervention that gives us competency again. These are the sort of areas I would discuss with the coaches. As it was hip, I was just going to show you some of these static areas to try and build confidence, whether it's going to be laterals, unders, or overs. We would build that because it also allows an opportunity to shift the focus from the injury and reframe perspective. Of course, teams that didn't make it to the quarterfinal also use hurdles. Uh, I'm not sure I'll get that video, but this is a video where we expand that and then we demonstrate a fulfillment of competence needs in rehab. And this gives a much better rehab uh, return to play outcome. Um, I like props as well, but I'll probably not use them too much. That's a Chinlin or an Asian ball. Uh, that's interesting. The, uh, the Asian ball was a precursor to the hacky sack. Uh, it's less dense. It means it holds up in the air a bit better, which means that we can use shoulders, arms, knees, ankles and things. We use that as part of our return to play. Uh, you'll see this when you get it ultimately, but I think this is exactly what physiotherapy does nowadays. Um, allows us to look at skill acquisition via the optimal loading tr mechanotransduction by reducing threat and allows us to have that reduced risk and increased confidence. Uh, this was a, a clip demonstrating some footage. Could you put the music up a little bit here in this one? Um, just watch what he's doing here and see if you can uh, work out where the uh, single leg hip abduction works in terms of preparing these guys ready for the sport. Is hopping significant for these players? Do we have any sound in that? We'll sound up now, possibly. And uh, look at the spinning, look at the turning, look what the hip has to do. And also, with your newfound knowledge and gap, uh, with the gap passability and affordances, look at how they decide where to go. Look at this fella. How does he decide where the space is? How is he going to take it? How does he beat players? How is he changing the rules of the game? How is he changing the task for himself? And how do you rehab that? Is the, triple, uh, is the triple hop for distance for Sean Johnson appropriate in this case? He has four side steps and then a pass from half, way, from, uh, half width. And that's a try to beat Australia, which has always got to be cherished. And then finally in this clip, we've got the big man. Sadly, he died this week. A remarkable athlete who's often underestimated where he was presumed it was all power. Watch him from here. Watch his foot movement. Watch how he operates to get himself into positions to get across the line and beat opponents. Being six foot four, 19 stone, and doing 10.8 for the 100 is probably not a bad way to be either. Um, so I think we've met our outcomes. Um, but do compliment and appreciate your athletes when they hit some of the goals. That is a hugely positive mindset for them. And they really require that. So make sure you do that. For those, for those in the audience who are appalled by that picture, can be joined by the rest of the audience who are appalled by that picture. <laughs> Context is everything. <laughs> and that's me saying thank you in all of the IFSPT languages. Please do get in touch, retweet. I've tweeted a few things I like and one or two others. Um, 
I'm sorry we couldn't use the props. There's a rugby ball here as well we couldn't inflate, but I'll give it to Mario for his office. World Cup rugby ball. Thank you.